we now on the team climate emergency in West Africa, impact and insight, a conversation on the IPCC report and beyond. Bonjour et bienvenue au webinar sur le thème urgence climatique. Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar, Climate Emergency in West Africa, Impacts and Insights, a conversation on the IPCC report. And I am the Regional Communication and Media Advisor for the International Development Research Center, IGRC, at the Regional Office for Central and West Africa in Dakar, Senegal. Before we get started, allow me to provide some guidance on the platform to ensure you don't miss anything from the presentations and the panel and can interact with the speakers. First, the interpretation. You would have already chosen your language of preference when you registered to the webinar. Please note that you can change this at any time by pressing on the engine button at the top right of your bar and choose the language of your preference in the settings section. Second, there will be a question and answer period during the event and you can submit a question or a comment at any time. To do so, simply click on the Slido icon at the top right and the application will open in a new window. You will then just have to type your question and submit it to the speakers. Please note that you can also interact with the question asked by other participants simply by clicking on the thumbs up button. The question will then be moved to the front page and highlighted. Third, you should experience any technical difficulties, click on the L button, submit your problem, and you will receive immediate assistance via email to begin troubleshooting your issue. Sans plus tarder, j'aimerais... Without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Jean Lebel, President of IDRC, for opening remarks. Jean, over to you. Thank you, Lancelot. Can everybody hear me? So it's a great pleasure for me as president uh, for the International Research Development uh, uh, Center. I'm here in Ottawa, but we have uh, offices in Africa, in Dakar, and in Nairobi, as well as uh, in Amman uh, to cover the northern part of Africa. I would like to wish you a warm welcome. I'm very happy to be with you today to participate in this very important conversation. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, IPCC report was published uh, on adaptations to climate change. Uh, we all know and we have recognized uh, that uh, Africa and the Sahel region are particularly affected by climate change, uh, whether these changes be in the west, north, east, or south. Uh, communities are already deeply affected by declining agricultural yields uh, compromising nutrition and food security, and jeopardizing people's uh, livelihoods. Since many years now, since 2005, 2006, more than $285 million have been invested in climate change research, uh, including substantial investments in sub-Saharan Africa and also in West Africa. These uh, projects allowed us to be able to develop policies and plans and also adaptation measures. Uh, I want to say that this is a major investment, but we weren't alone. There were other partners who also joined us, namely the uh, British as well as the Canadian government. Uh, these projects have allowed us to develop policies and plans with the goal of increasing community resilience to climate shocks and supporting the integration of social equity issues into climate action. IDRC's strategy recognizes that there are two major factors that have been and that will always be present uh, until 2030 at least, uh, climate change and inequalities. These are the two major factors that constitute the major barriers with respect to achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and our response and your response as scientists to these world uh, problems is an essential priority. And there are also other types of phenomena, conflicts, pandemics. Uh, that said, climate change and inequalities are the two major elements that will not stop. Uh, 
and we need to be particularly attentive to these particular issues. Uh, in order to enhance inclusion of African perspectives on adaptation science, uh, IDRC has supported the strengthening and the contribution of African scientists to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, IPCC, including the sixth assessment report of Working Group 2 and its chapter on Africa. This work was supported by the Climate Change Adaptation and Resilience Partnership, uh, CLARE, between IDRC and the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, the FCDO. This dialogue today provides us with an opportunity to disseminate the findings of the report and to demonstrate uh, all of Africa's climate leadership. Uh, in this session, it, during this webinar, we hope to highlight key findings, critical trends, and emerging issues specific to Africa, West, uh, Western Africa as well. And we want as well to identify gaps and priorities for research and action in Western Africa. We are fortunate to have an esteemed group of speakers and panelists with us today. I would now like to introduce uh, our key speakers. Uh, and I would uh, like to ask our technical team to ensure that their cameras are activated in order that we are able to introduce them. Our first speaker will be D Dr. Edmund Tocte, who is an assistant professor at the National University of Agriculture in Bene. Good morning, Edmond. How are you today? Good morning, Jean. Everything's fine here. And tell me, what is the weather there? It's 32 degrees here. It's lovely here, says uh, Dr. Tatin. It's uh, the beginning of the, sis the season here, and we hope that uh, the good weather will continue. We'll come back to you in a few s minutes, uh, says uh, Jean Lebel. who is the director of the Climate Risk Lab at the African Climate and Development Initiative at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Welcome, Christopher. How are you this morning in Cape Town? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. And temperature in Cape Town is about? It's about 25. It's really nice, yeah. Uh, 33, 25. We are in the high grade. Over here, it's minus 2. So in <laughs> Ottawa, Canada. So Dr. Tote and Dr. Trizos uh, are the authors and principal coordinator of the Chapter 6 of the uh, GIEC, uh, the IPCC report. Uh, on the evolution of climate and from the working group two. And they will uh, look in particular to the West Africa in the case of Enmo, but also having a Pan-African vision with Christopher. Welcome to both of you. À la suite de cette présentation de Chris et... And then following their speeches, we will have a distinguished panel uh, We've established, uh, we've assembled rather distinguished panelists, and that we will be able to hear their points of view and their comments. Uh, presentation of Christopher and Enmo will be Dr. Adelina Mansa, who is Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Environment and Sanitation Studies in the College of Basic and Applied Science at the University of Ghana. Welcome, Adelina. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being with us. So you're based in Accra. What's the temperature in Accra this morning? Uh, this afternoon, we're one o'clock now, so it's uh, about 32, 33 degrees Celsius. Fantastic, and thanks for reminding me that I am in the morning, you are in the afternoon, and we have a global audience that might be at night. So, uh, pleasure to have you with us. Ici avec nous, nous avons uh, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. We also have with us the Ambassador Sini Nafo, the High Representative of the President of the Republic of Mali on climate and spokesperson for the African Group of Climate Negotiators. Uh, welcome, Ambassador, uh, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. You are on, on mute. Uh, good morning, everyone, says the Ambassador. It's uh, 23 degrees here. Oh. You were ahead of me. You saw what the trend was with respect to the weather during this webinar. Thank you for being with us this afternoon, this afternoon for you.
And we'll come back to you when we get back to the panel after the presentations. And our last panelist will be Ms. Zenabu Zegda, coordinator of the Women Environmental Program in Burkina, Burkina Faso. So I'm going to ask you again, uh, what is the weather in your part of the world today? Good morning, Dr. Jean, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Of course, I am in Ouaga, and it's 38 degrees. It's cloudy. It's very dusty here. So it's the dust coming from the Sahara. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mensa and Ambassador Nafo. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, and this panel will be moderated uh, by my friend uh, and our colleague, uh, Fatima Denton. She's the director of the United Nations uh, Universities Africa Natural Resource Institute. Uh, she's also in Ghana. Good morning, Fatima. How are you today? Hello, Jean. I'm fine. Thank you. So on the campus where you are, you, our colleague told us it was 32 degrees. Well, what's the weather here where you are? Well, I think it's actually warmer than that in here. But so we've heard about the weather. We've heard about where you're speaking to us from today. Uh, and once again, I would like to welcome everybody to this webinar uh, that will be a very interesting uh, and instructive. Uh, Passing the baton to Enmo and to Christopher that will lead us with a presentation on what are the key take home message from the IPCC report, the sixth one from the group two. Enmo, Christopher, à vous la parole. Et... Christopher and Edmond, over to you. Oh, merci bien. Thank you very much, Jean. Before anything else, uh, I would like uh, once again to thank uh, the IDRC for have given us this opportunity to share some of the highlights and the key highlights uh, of this report with the African community. Thank you. Could I have the first slide, please? Could I see the slide a little larger, please? If you uh, click on the uh, image uh, with your right, if you right click rather on the image, you'll be able to see the full uh, slide. OK, says Dr. Tate. And then you can pin this image. Okay, I think we're good now. Actions sometimes take time. <laughs> bon, voilà, nous allons... So today we will be talking about the uh, key highlights of the report. Uh, this report was published uh, February 28th, uh, and it is the result of efforts by many colleagues and contributors. Chris and I are simply the spokespeople spokespeople for the group. Uh, could I see the second si slide, please? Uh, the first thing and the first key message that we would like to uh, share is that uh, Africa is one of the continents, continents with the lowest greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but is subjected to, on a number of fronts, uh, the uh, the damages of climate change, and that's what we will try to demonstrate this morning. Uh, next slide, please. When we talk about the effects, uh, we can see that the temperature, whether it's average or extreme uh, temperatures, uh, they are increasing a bit everywhere in Africa. And particularly in Western Africa, what we have seen in Western Africa is annual and seasonal average temperatures uh, have increased by one to two 
to about one to three degrees since 1970 and are more pronounced in the Sahara. So in Algeria, in the Maghreb, in Tunisia, and in Morocco or in Libya. And also, we've seen the same trends in Sahel, Senegal, Burkina Faso, in other areas. We've also seen an increase in frequency of droughts since 1950. And in Western Africa, we've seen that there have been heat waves that are more intense and longer than in the last two decades. And since 1990, Western Africa has been much more humid with fewer but more intense rainfall events. But we've also noticed as well that the rainfall is much more intense, which obviously creates a lot of damages. Uh, next slide, please. And speaking about vulnerability and exposure to climate change in Africa, what we have seen is that uh, the exposure and vulnerability to climate change it depends on several factors. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, a major uh, major section of employment in the area is in agriculture and 95 percent of agricultural production in Africa depends on rainfall. Uh, so for irrigation there's a lot more control in, in northern and southern Africa. It's, but in, it's only in those area where we have a little bit of control in irrigation uh, in other areas, uh, really everything depends on rainfall. So everything that's associated with rainfall will have an effect on production. We also say that vulnerability is associated with a number of factors. There's also the issue of population growth. Uh, Africa has seen uh, the strongest uh, demographic growth uh, and we will speak namely about uh, our infrastructural development. This is happening very quickly and also agriculture Demogra uh, demographic uh, changes and urbanization force people to uh, move to agriculture in climate prone areas. Uh, so what we have seen specifically in area, there have been over 60% of urban residents in Africa who live in informal settlements, uh, precarious settlements, because they are forced to uh, live in these areas because they're looking for jobs or because the conditions in the rural areas uh, are, don't really lend themselves uh, to that type of thing. So people are getting prepared to settle everywhere in areas that aren't necessarily suitable. We've also seen uh, that on the vulnerability of our continent is that 66% of workers uh, worked in the informal sector. And the informal sector means that uh, there is not good coverage, not a good coverage of risks. Uh, and as a result, uh, people who were working in this sector were more vulnerable. We've also noticed that uh, mortality associated with disasters is 15 times higher in highly vulnerable countries. And this comes from the fact that the ability to adapt uh, is very low in those particular locations. As a result, uh, when there are shocks, disasters, uh, we basically have to depend on divine intervention. <laughs> Urbanization uh, with with the increasing urbanization, rather, are pushing people to settle in areas that aren't, don't really lend themselves to agriculture. For example, people will settle in coastal area, in floodplains, and also in dry lands. So we've seen uh, this situation in certain zones. Uh, people were living in very inappropriate areas, uh, and people will settle in zones that really are not adapted uh, in those types of situations uh, they are marginalized and vulnerable communities that are more exposed to risks uh, so. next slide please
So we said that Africa uh, contributes less or the least to greenhouse gas emissions, and we can see on this graph that indeed <coughs> Africa is very, very far behind Asia, Europe, uh, and when we look at uh, more uh, the data in more detail, we can see that we're very far from being uh, the biggest polluters. We can see that the more industrialized countries are more um, are, are, are produce more uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So this graph, of course, there's Egypt and Nigeria. So this graph shows us uh, our contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. But despite that, despite the fact that we're a, a tiny contributor to uh, GHG, we um, we sustain uh, the consequences because our capacity to adapt is uh, is smaller and it's really put to the challenge in this fight so the impacts um are widespread in in very different uh, many different areas such as health for instance uh, we will see we can see that with present day trends and the next slide please with present day trends, when we look at the Western Africa region, and more specifically, when we look at uh, disease, uh, we can see that there's a huge prevalence of, uh, of malaria in our area, basically due to the increase in average monthly temperatures. That creates an ecosystem which um, is perfect for the uh, proliferation of uh, malaria causing uh, circumstances or insects. Also, I was saying that marginalized populations are the most vulnerable. Uh, we can see that climate change, of course, affects income, their income, and makes them even less capable of um, facing expenses in health, in housing, et cetera, which creates even more inequities between the different uh, uh, social classes. Uh, in terms of heat waves, we saw that the mortality rate is sometimes higher than normal in periods where temperatures are very high. We've had cases uh, in uh, Burkina, in Ghana, where we've had uh, cardiovascular disease, a very high rate. And these are a, du a direct corollary, corollary of uh, heat waves and climate changes in those areas. Next slide, please. Let's talk about uh, the impacts of climate change on ecosystems. With this increase in temperatures, we saw that there could be an increase in freshwater temperatures as well. Usually, it's between 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 per decade, and sometimes an increase up to 0 0.6 degrees in the vault in the Volta in Ghana, for instance. Of course, that has an impact on water quality, on productivity of algae, uh, and on uh, fish uh, stocks, fish species, and invertebrate. These conditions will no longer allow them to reproduce, and so some fish will migrate, and that is going to uh, have a direct impact on the revenue of uh, people's uh, living from fishing, and that uh, that uh, supports what I was saying in the previous uh, slide um, to the effect that climate change uh, exacerbate um, social inequities, inequalities. And we've seen this in Benin and the coastal zone where several of these actors that operate in these areas had to uh, opt for, for other uh, economic activities. We also saw that uh, uh, the climate conditions and the increase in temperatures create conditions conducive to forest fires. And we've seen each year cases where this area of the forest uh, um, was burned down, 
But beyond that, we also saw that the ecosystem created is conducive uh, to um, the presence of uh, woody species. Uh, and so makes things uh, much more difficult to uh, find forage for livestock. And of course, that has a direct impact on raising cattle, which um, are livestock. And so um, that c creates um, conditions where communities try to move uh, in greater numbers, and that exacerbates tension sometimes between um, between producers, between different uh, different groups. So these are a few of the impacts that we can describe on the ecosystem and the impacts of climate change more specifically. Next slide, please. Thank you. What concerns us and is very interesting is food safety. The contrast is huge in Africa. We have a zone where demographic pressure is extremely high, and we saw that uh, when temperatures increase, this translates by a drop uh, in uh, agricultural productivity. So a loss of close to 34% globally since the 1960s due to climate change. And in sub-Saharan Africa, of course, 34% is for the entire continent, continent but in sub-Saharan Africa, we saw that uh, cultures uh, such as maize, and maize is a very important culture. It, it's consumed, it's, it's uh, um, uh, used everywhere in Africa, uh, in Mali, in Eastern Africa. Uh, they talk about Ugali, and in, the, in uh, Southern Africa as well, or South Africa, the yields have uh, gone down by close to 16% for maize, so that is huge. Same thing with wheat, um, a very important culture uh, being um, used everywhere on the continent. A, a drop in yield of 2.3 percent because of climate change. The drama here is that two-thirds of Africans perceive that agricultural production conditions have worsened in the last 10 years. And they make a connection between that and climate change. And others say, yeah, yeah, there are climate changes, but uh, perhaps uh, uh, more connected to the wrath of God, or the fact that uh, uh, peoples are no longer respecting traditions, etc. So we see we see a different uh, um, reactions to climate change. The next slide: access to water. Water is life, is what we say in Africa, and we saw that rainfall and river discharge has become extremely variable sometimes with variations of up to 50 percent, uh, we saw that rainfall has, um, that there's been an increase in rainfall, uh, but there's also much more drought. And of course, uh, we've uh, seen population increases, and so the demand in water, whether it be for uh, consumption, irrigation, um, domestic use um, is higher, and so availability of water is really an issue, and that has an impact uh, on uh, water available for the populations, for agriculture, for hydroelectric uh, power, and for tourism. So here are some of the effects of climate change concerning the availability and access to water. Next slide, please. This slide is extremely interesting because it, it shows how climate change have a certain impact on the economies of our countries. This graph was developed from data uh, collected from 91 to 2010, and it shows that with an increase of average temperature and reduction in rainfall, there's been an impact on economic growth in Africa, thus uh, creating challenges. And so we can see this tension on our economy. It's a lot more uh, specific than in other regions. Uh, now, I tried to uh, to 
put that slide in full screen, but it it, it really uh, doesn't show up. So it's very hard to, for me to read the slide. Could it be made bigger, slightly bigger? So I can give you a few examples of some countries. I know that Mali, for instance. No, I'm uh, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Perhaps I mean we can we can enlarge it a little bit. I'll let you continue because Chris is going to be on soon as well. Okay. So we can see that a country such as uh, Mauritania, uh, for instance, um, is sustaining a huge impact because of uh, climate change. And there's Mali, there's uh, uh, Niger. These are countries I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have Sudan, Chad. Uh, these are countries that sustain uh, the a huge impacts for climate change. Um, and with a, 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 um, a direct effect on their economy. Next slide, please. So we will now try to talk about, so, so far rather, we, we uh, tried to show how climate change affects our lives. Uh, and now we've gone through a few projections. So the uh, global warming level is of 1.1 degree above 1.5 degree the risks are higher and one of our messages key messages is that in africa we must we must stay under the 1.5 degree mark because beyond that things will become even more uncontrollable. We have uh, the epidemic of dengue and yellow uh, fever that are expected to spread further in the Sahel region. If we go beyond 1.5 uh, degree, there um, could be disruptions of water availability. I mentioned that. If we are now at 1.1 degree and there's such tension on water availability, if we go beyond 1.5 degrees, it would be even worse. There would be loss of biodiversity and extension of species increases. So if we go beyond that level, we will lose uh, some species. And when we go beyond two, if we were to go beyond two degrees uh, of uh, warming level, the risk would be even higher. Uh, there could be a decline in yields of staple crops uh, of more than 40%, especially for maize. Um, we would lose um, pastures, and we sustain to lose more than 50% of freshwater fish. Beyond these effects that we may sustain, it's the, uh, the whole uh, economic uh, situation, the social situation of groups that depend from these, uh, that depend on these activities, rather. I'm thinking of, uh, of uh, fishermen. I'm thinking of, uh, of those um, who uh, uh, raise uh, livestock. Uh, this is going to create even more tensions for them. And producers might e want to travel even further to find pasture for their humans. And what will be the impact on, on people's, uh, you know, when we talk about a crop such as maize that may sustain uh, to, uh, um, to have a drop in yield of up to 40%. That is huge. So we tried through this graph to summarize the possible impacts for instance, we can see that if we uh, go beyond the 1.5 degree uh, of, of warming, the risk would be huge in terms of loss of uh, biodiversity. And looking at mortality and looking at health overall, beyond 1.5 degrees, uh, it's, the same, it's the same picture. The next slide, please. So overall, uh, uh, our message is that if global warming exceeds current levels, the ability of adaptation measures to compensate for the risk will be significantly reduced, which is going to uh, make our communities even more at risk. Uh, they'll be even more fragile, which uh, speaks to an urgent uh, um, action 
uh, needed. Every fraction of global warming increases the risk, and that is the message that we are uh, trying to convey. And we are counting on all interveners, all actors, to pass on this message so that everyone becomes aware of the fact that every degree uh, or every fraction of global warming, every degree of global warming increases uh, the risk. Uh, and um, rapid and deep emission reductions and adaptation measures that are um, ambitious are needed to limit risks. Uh, we also saw that limiting warming to 1.5 degree rather than 2 degree would increase GDP per capita by at least 5 percent uh, by 2050 and by 10 to 20 percent uh, by uh, 2001. Uh, 2100 in almost all African countries, which face huge uh, challenges uh, such as creating job opportunities for youth, uh, how to guarantee a secure um, health system for the populations which are always increasing, how to offer uh, living conditions for these populations, and any delay in in action will. Uh, work against us possibly guaranteeing um, a safe future, which speaks to the urgency of acting now before we go beyond 1.1 degree. Next slide, please. So there are a few adaptation options which are possible, which have been used so far. But what we've noticed is that these adaptation measures are fragmented. Sometimes they are uh, done just um, with superficial changes, but not deep changes in our communities. These adaptation measures are sometimes uh, individual, um, just taken in the household or in a small community, and uh, not led by governments or NGOs. Uh, so we have the potential of developing Uh, local uh, knowledge, endogenous knowledge, and how we can uh, value that, that knowledge in our adaptive measures. We've seen that in uh, different locations of uh, Benin, Burkina Faso, Kenya, where um, um, farmers looking at uh, the direction of the wind, looking at uh, animal behavior, can predict if there's going to be wind, uh, there's going to be rain or not. Uh, we've seen different um, social programs to face catastrophes, to face risks of catastrophes, but these programs are not robust enough to really protect communities. So, so far in Africa, we've had some initiatives for adaptation, but they are still simply local, and they do not produce deep changes in our communities to really allow them to, to face uh, new circumstances and to adapt. Next slide, please. We have uh, examples of adaptation measures or options used, uh, change of practices, uh, using more resistant varieties, opting for maize varieties that can yield, have a yield in 45 days instead of three months. Uh, um, we have adaptation based on ecosystem exploitation, um, mulching, for instance. Uh, in the community of Mokuna, they're doing things to protect the ground's humidity and to to use uh, the, the the soil a little bit more. We have institutional measures as well, climate governance, uh, where uh, our governments uh, are doing are doing everything they can to um, provide resources for climate governance. Uh, and there are adaptations in terms of uh, our countries or entities that work on climate change. Of course, there's, there are technological adaptations uh, um, and the creation of climate services, for instance. We're talking about climate information that we give uh, uh, producers to allow them to make decisions in real time. Next slide, please. Can we just accelerate things a tiny bit because we will be short of time with our panel? And I'm sorry to um, 
I'm sorry to hurry you uh, uh, in mon, but we are running a little bit late. Okay, I will go a little bit faster, and so I can I can skip that slide and move to the next one. Thank you very much. This is something very specific. It's something new that we've developed in the report, where we've seen adaptation because. Uh, uh, we've seen that something works in, in a local area, and so we replicate that in other uh, areas without necessarily uh, seeing the same benefits. But that has allowed us to see the efficiency and the efficacy of adaptation measure and, and, and measures, and we are able to measure them using different factors, social, institutional, economic factors, to see what the benefits of measure A or measure B is. In that context, we can say, in terms of uh, the efficiency of these uh, measures, uh, looking at uh, investments, for instance, financial investments, we saw that these measures are extremely efficient. Same for um, migration. And that is something that I might come back to. Migration, we saw that it uh, it uh, has huge uh, benefits because uh, um, people who do uh, move send money back to uh, to their families who uh, have stayed behind. We see that ma water management measures are very efficient as well. The next slide, please. And these measures are interesting. I uh, said that I would come back to two of them, so irrigation and migration. In terms of irrigation, in several communities, we saw that uh, uh, people uh, are promoting a green revolution. So irrigation is a method uh, to facilitate uh, access to water and a better control of water, but that has impacts or effects, um, negative effects, which we call risks of maladjustment, because um, things were not thought out, thought out uh, enough. And same thing for migration. It's true. It is a, an adaptation measure, but it can be um, done poorly. And those who are left uh, behind has uh, a lot more to do. Um, and suffer uh, worse conditions. For instance, women very often stay behind. The man moves, uh, and and the women stay behind and have to do all the work. The men come back, and sometimes they bring disease back with them. So these are um, the effects of some adaptation measures. They have to be well thought out to not uh, create a risk of maladjustment. Adaptation measures, next slide, please. Adaptation measures that we are promoting are early warning systems based on targeted climate services. And we really focus on targeted climate services because not all producers, not all communities need the same type of information. So we need to calibrate information based on demand. We have social protection programs. We need to promote them and risk or disaster management programs. Uh, we need to diversify agriculture and livelihood. This is something that communities use. We think we need to focus more on livelihood diversification. Earlier in the slides, I said that um, a large part of our communities depend on agriculture. So how can we create opportunities to allow people to move on to other economic activities? One of the key messages here, if we can move to the next slide, is research. Edmo, I'm terribly sorry. We will have to conclude here. That is my last slide. Great. That was my last slide, because time is going to be too short. So our, our uh, what we're saying is that climate research in Africa faces severe data constraints, uh, as well as inequities in funding and research leadership that reduce Adaptive, adaptive uh, capacity. That said, I will give the floor to Chris, and thank you very much for your patience. Uh, thank you, Edmo. That was an amazing presentation that gave us uh, uh, a complete picture on what you worked on at IPCC and done uh, very eloquently. Thank you. Chris, over to you. Slides be shared again, please. And Edmund, while we wait, thank you for that excellent overview of the risks and the adaptation options.
Thank you, Chris. And next slide, please. So Edmund described many of the um, research, many of the risks assessed in the report, and also many of the adaptation options. I will talk through some of the barriers and limitations to those adaptation options and the enabling conditions for overcoming them. Next slide, please. So the report assesses, and the science is quite clear, that major barriers to accelerated adaptation in Africa include information, climate awareness and technologies, climate services. It also includes financial limitations and barriers. And the third major category is around governance institutions and the limitations that they may provide or enable overcoming those limitations in the context of adaptation. Next slide, please. So when we talk about enabling conditions, the report talks a lot about climate development. I'll just talk through a few of those now in the context of Africa. Next slide, please. So major areas for enabling climate resilient development, particularly around adaptation, are increased knowledge and data, capacity building, particularly climate literacy, finance, governance, legislation, so climate change framework bills that set the context for further climate change adaptation action at national and subnational levels ecosystem-based adaptation, and finally, cross-sectoral approaches. And so there's a planning across multiple sectors, for example, food, water, energy, biodiversity, and health, to make sure that adaptation actions benefit all sectors. So major areas for enabling climate resilient development the first is funding knowledge, research, and especially research leadership in an African context. Since 1990, only 3.8% of climate-related research funding globally has gone to African topics, and only about 1% of funding has actually gone to African institutions. And this is a major constraint on the adaptive capacity of African communities because it limits their ability to understand climate risks and research climate adaptation mitigation options, both in terms of adapting to climate risks, but also the transition to renewable energies. Another main resilient development is in supporting data flow and filling knowledge gaps, a particular data and information gap in Africa is a small number of regular weather stations that report that these weather stations or regularly reporting weather stations are very important for developing climate information and services like early warning systems. And large parts of Central and West Africa currently lack weather station networks that regularly report data on local climate conditions. Another constraint is regularly reported agricultural data and particularly Many African countries do not report regular census data, and this is a severe limitation when trying to identify where vulnerable people live and who is most vulnerable. Having access to regular census data is really important for targeting interventions at the most vulnerable. A third key category for enabling climate resilient development that the report identifies is improving climate literacy in Africa, and that's defined as having heard of climate change, understanding the causes of climate change, and also having some idea of the implications of climate change. And across 33 African countries, on average about 23 to 66% of the population are aware of climate change. This is quite low. And so a major opportunity here, the report shows is that higher levels of educational attainment are associated with higher levels of climate change literacy. And so investment in education and climate proofing education and securing strong educational outcomes for young Africans is a major way to advance climate literacy and increase the amount of informed climate change adaptation happening on the continent. A third area, sorry, a fourth area is around building capacity, particularly decision-making in the face of uncertainty. There is deep uncertainty around many areas of West and East Africa, what future precipitation trends might be like. In the case of temperature, there's much higher confidence. 
And so to overcome these uncertainties in decision making takes a lot of collaboration between local leaders at the sub-national level, like districts, as well as at the level of national governments, and also across sectors, be that academia, people in the private sector, people in the public sector. So there's a real need for increased collaboration in decision making. Next slide, please. This is an illustration just to go back to this point around research funding showing that since 1990, only about 4% of global research funding on climate change has been allocated to Africa. On the bottom left there, you can see the trend over time. On the top right, something that might be described as a climate injustice is that most of the climate research funding on Africa has actually been allocated to institutions outside of Africa, primarily in Europe and North America. It's only Kenya and South Africa that make the top 10 countries receiving climate finance, sorry, funding for climate research on Africa. Finally, the distribution of this funding has focused on ecosystems, food systems, and fresh water. That's appropriate. They are key risks for Africa. But to date, there's been much less research funding focused on other important risks, primarily to health, to livelihoods, risks in cities and urban areas that Edmund highlighted are increasingly important, and also security and conflict. Next slide, please. This research, low level of research funding has severe consequences for understanding adaptation options in Africa. What this map is showing is a synthesis of over 15,000 studies published on adaptation. And you can see that in Africa, for most countries, they have some of the least numbers of studies on adaptation options published on those countries. South Africa, parts of East Africa and Ghana are small exceptions, but for the continent overall, there's a very limited amount of adaptation research being published in the academic literature. And this is in many cases a direct result of that limited funding for African researchers. Next slide, please. This slide goes beyond financing for research to financing for the implementation of climate change adaptation and also mitigation of greenhouse gases. And there are three main messages here. That the assessment shows, the IPCC assessment. The first is that finance for adaptation in Africa is below even the lowest adaptation cost estimates. So over the last 20 years, that plot in the lower left shows for all regions except Central Africa, there has been an increase in adaptation related finance commitments to African regions, especially coming from developed countries and from multilateral financial institutions such as the World Bank. But this finance is still typically in each year billions of dollars less than the lowest adaptation cost estimates at the continental level. A second finding is that a greater proportion of finance at the continental level, over 60% or about 60% has gone to greenhouse gas mitigation and a smaller proportion has gone to adaptation. Of course, there should be a lot of finance to greenhouse gas adaptation, but in many African, sorry, greenhouse gas mitigation but in many African countries, there's also a strong demand for adaptation finance to help people to adapt to climate change risks. And this highlights the requirement for increased adaptation funding for many African countries if they are to meet the challenges of climate change in the next decade. A third major and very concerning point is that the levels of disbursement of climate finance are very low. So the first two figures on this slide show you how much finance is committed. So that's finance where someone has made the political or the financial commitment to send finance to a particular climate adaptation or mitigation project. But what this third slide shows is that in the case of Africa, only about 46% of that finance that was committed between 2014 and 2018 actually went to project implementation on the ground. The rest has not yet been dispersed. And in the case of West Africa, this is a particularly low number where it's around 33%. And this suggests that there are some uniquely strong barriers to finance flows for climate adaptation and mitigation in Africa. Because for overall development funding, the picture in Africa is very different. It's over 90% of finance commitments end up being dispersed. So there are lots of barriers here around project planning and implementation, local governance, international finance governance and finance flows that are preventing the finance once it's been committed from actually reaching the ground. Next slide, please. And 
this finance is important and these enabling conditions are important because there are lots of bright spots in the report, lots of opportunities for accelerating climate adaptation in Africa. And I'll just highlight four here briefly as the last slide. The first is governance. There's a lot of evidence in the report that inclusive governance approaches, particularly those that focus on the most marginalized and focus on increasing equity in climate change adaptation can have really enormous benefits in increasing well-being of those who are most vulnerable to climate change. A second bright spot is many African countries are in the process of currently debating or they've already passed climate change framework legislation. So this is legislation that sets the context for climate change mitigation and adaptation in those countries. There's some evidence that having these framework rules in place can accelerate climate action. So that's another bright spot and the report assesses that this legislation is beneficial. A third is ecosystem-based adaptation. There are many opportunities for ecosystem-based adaptation across the continent. For example, the use of mangroves to protect against storm surges. But a warning here is the lower the level of global warming, the more nature can help us. If we let global warming go beyond 1.5 or especially beyond two degrees, natural ecosystems start to reach their limits where they're no longer able to help us adapt. So ecosystem-based adaptations are a key opportunity for Africa if we can hold global warming to below, well below two degrees Celsius. And finally, there's a lot of evidence in the report that cross-sectoral approaches that take an integrated approach, an all-of-government approach, where climate change is not just seen as the job of the energy ministry or the environment ministry, but also includes treasury, the minister of finance, the presidency, key government sectors working together with the private sector and the public sector across energy, water, ecosystems, health, biodiversity and economy, this integrated approach can potentially benefit people and nature for out multiple decades into the future by locking in positive solutions that increase human well-being, protect nature and reduce future climate risks. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. So in the end, climate resilient development requires this mix of long-term planning, and a focus on equity, especially on the most vulnerable, to bring about mechanisms that reduce inequalities. And the final slide, next slide please, is to say thank you and to give the links to the underlying information here on the African chapter. Thank you so much. Christopher, thank you so much for your presentation and Enmo also. I think that you have set the table from the details of the impact and what are the adaptation measures that have taken place, could take place, what are the impact of this increase towards, you know, what can be done in terms of resolution, whether from governance to legislation to attenuation measure and financing. You showed the gap. You pointed to the peculiar situation of Africa where the contribution is very limited in terms of greenhouse gas emission, but where the impacts are all there and where adaptation is more than ever required. And I think that set the table perfectly well for our panelists. Alors, Fatima, je vais demander à l'ambassadeur. So, Fatima, I'm going to ask uh, the ambassador and others. But Fatima, I would like to turn the mic over to you and with our friends uh, Adinala Mensa, Ambassador Senya Nafu, and Madame Zenav Zenabu Sagda. I would invite Fatima to moderate this panel following this very interesting presentation from Christopher and Edmund. Over to you, Fatima. Thank you, Jean, and thank you as well uh, to the uh, main speaker, Christopher and Edmund. So, hello to the panelists. Uh, hello again. Uh, I, first of all, I wanted to start uh, to speak about a number of things that have been uh, said. You heard the president of the IDRC, Jean Abel, uh, who spoke about the African populations who are uh, more and more uh, being impacted by climate change. Uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, also spoke about uh, human suffering and Edmund and Christopher really made, uh, made an emphasis on the biophysical impacts but also everything that's related to social vulnerability. So I think that the alarm uh, has been rung. 
So what I would like to know is that, based on what you heard, are there things that uh, surprised you? First of all, I would like to start with Adelina. Should, but from your vantage point, where you sit, um, are there things in the report that surprised you? Um, surprise, not really, but in terms of um, more information that was needed, I, I had a few thoughts on that. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all those who are watching us today. And thank you, Fatima, for that. I'm speaking as a researcher. I have been involved in uh, climate research for, for a few years. And um, one of the things that keep coming up is and which has been captured very nicely by Chris is uh, the issues of information. Now, information is uh, both a barrier but an enabler as well. And uh, they have been giving us. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a message that my audio is not good. Am I clear? Yeah. Oh, we can hear. Right okay. So, so information I think is um, is key. Uh, and into being able to set up appropriate adaptation options to be able to ensure that the community is, is also involved. But one thing that I find is not, has not been covered per se is the motivators that encourage the, or that support the enabling factors. So we've highlighted various aspects in terms of um, improving literacy, for example, or um, governance uh, structures, but we haven't really poured down into understanding what some of these motivators are. I mean, these could be institutional, and we could tie them into, I mean, at the local level, you are looking at um, perhaps the role and influence of uh, religious leaders, for example, or um, you can have cultural uh, Cultural, other cultural motivators that we can say are context specific. And in that case, it's difficult to, to isolate, but I think we can come to a certain understanding of these motivators in a way that we can extrapolate it across the different countries within the region. Thank you. Thank you, Adelina. Um, Ambassador Nafo. Ambassador Nafo, over to you. With respect to the first question, are there things that uh, surprise you with respect to this report? The one element of, of surprise, which is the uh, the acceleration and the uh, the amplification of, of climate change. Uh, uh, frankly, uh, some of us already in 2015, looking at some of the models which went into the the NDCs. Uh, of African countries in 2015, we felt we felt in, in 2015, which is just yesterday, uh, when it comes to, to to modeling or to to science, that we would only see some of the impacts that we see now, maybe in 2030 or or or, or beyond 2030. So the biggest surprise to us is that in the report is the acceleration and the amplific amplification of both frequency and intensity of climate impacts. Therefore, the need for adaptation, that's one. Uh, the second, uh, you, 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 actually, you also posed the question of um, you know, what we think should have been, should have been addressed. And, and, I, and some of us felt that the, uh, the link, the driver of all of this, the driver of all of this is the uh, global mitigation ambition or the lack thereof. And that mm -hmm. was, that should also be made extremely clear but we are seeing those impacts because of uh, but but maybe that was for the uh, for the uh, the working group one but that you know we should you know the the working group two should also see that as the key because the key driver of impacts is the lack of uh, uh, global emission reduction and, and 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 therefore the need to uh, to uh, um, to address that and the third element which was missing and that's because and i'm being opportunistic here uh, the African group uh, requested a few, few years ago to IPCC to work on adaptation metrics and indicators, and they literally ditch, ditch us away. Mm -hmm. So uh, we thought that this, you know, and, and we're coming back now to say thank you for the report, 
can you help us? Can you work on adaptation metrics so that we can track progress, we can track gaps, not just at the regional, but national and local level? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, Saini. Um, Madame uh, Zainavou, je, je... Madame uh, Zainavou, over to you. Could you give us a little more information? Because I think uh, Edmund uh, has spoken about uh, the uh, gender impacts. Uh, oftentimes, we don't take into account uh, the inclusion, uh, but also there are practical uh, knowledge uh, that we should use. Uh, and uh, sometimes we put more emphasis on scientific knowledge instead of uh, informal knowledge, which, ha which can have an impact on women. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatima. I'm very happy with what the report was able to uh, bring to light with respect to contribu contribution and also to take into account local knowledge uh, and also the contribution of communities generally. But for this first part, I would like to focus on the lack of data and on adaptation. We have mentioned that these areas were very um, weak in Africa, but also I wanted to underline the fact that it's very rare to find uh, um, gender-specific uh, data, namely with respect to adaptation. Uh, and at the end, I appreciated the need for a equal distribution of uh, adaptation managers, uh, but it's also with respect to financing and with respect to adaptation measures, uh, how much of the financing is going to women with respect to adaptation and how many are being able to take advantage of it. These are data that are missing and that are not visible. So I will stop there. And I'll add more information about the role of women in adaptation later on. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you um, from the African group of negotiators perspective. There is definitely a sense that Africa is ill prepared for the impacts of climate change. And you're talking about preparing for COP27. Um, Edmund um, mentioned, and, and uh, Christopher as well, a lot of problems related to finance and access to finance. But there's also the problem in terms of the, the, the research leadership that was talked about. And somewhat um, our inability to produce bankable proposals. Does the report help you um, in terms of coming up with other concrete evidence um, that Africa needs support, especially in this area of finance? Well, uh, I mean, clearly what the, the report uh, does, uh, as I said, it's to make the case in a most, um, uh, in a most explicit manner that uh, the situation is getting worse, that uh, climate impacts, uh, increase of temperature, uh, increase of uh, frequency and intensity of um, uh, extreme weather events is, is eroding uh, development gains. Uh, throughout uh, the regions and across throughout the region uh, of, of, this, so the, of the continent and across, uh, across sectors. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's clear. A and this is an argument that the uh, African group started already in 2015 going into Paris. If you remember, and, and, I, and, and you must remember because you supported us technically in that work, it was the African group which said, we needed adaptation in NDCs. You remember that one? Mm -hmm. When the world was not paying attention, the world was only interested in mitigation. We were the one to say, no, our climate actions must, uh, uh, um, uh, they must include adaptation. And we got that, fine. This is part of now, uh, adaptation is part of uh, climate action. It's part of the uh, national determined contribution. Second, uh, now adaptation, the link between temperature increase, mitigation, and adaptation, meaning the more, I mean, 
the less mitigation you have, the more temperature increase, the more impact you have, the more adaptation you have to do. That, uh, uh, that trilogy or that link was not established at the multilateral level. Actually, at the multilateral negotiation, we were told adaptation is your problem. It's, uh, it's actually, it's maybe even because of your development or your lack of development or policy choices or planning choices, but it was adaptation was seen not as a global common, but at, as a national local endeavor. And we have also uh, succeeded in having what we call a global goal for adaptation, really to link global emission reduction or lack thereof, uh, increase of climate impacts, and then, uh, um, and then adaptation needs. Well, next step is implementation. In 2015 as well, African Heads of State launched a, a, an African initiative to address adaptation in a comprehensive manner. So I was very happy to hear uh, uh, Professor uh, Trisos, uh, uh, Chris, and also uh, Professor Totin. Very small parenthesis, um, I need to commend, I really need to congratulate and to commend uh, both of you, and, and actually through you, to commend uh, all the African scientists and experts involved in this specific report and uh, involved in IPCC in general. Uh, we have been very frustrated in the past because of the lack of uh, African scientists and experts' presence. Uh, what we are seeing now is, is very encouraging, and we, we really hope that uh, this will continue and that the work will now go into even more granular uh, specific, uh, granular level in terms of uh, regions and in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, 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 sectors as well. So, 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 so kudos to you. I forgot that that needed to be done. Going back on the, the implementation, you're right, and Chris, Chris said it. What we have realized is that we need to adopt a, in, a comprehensive, uh, integrated, uh, all government approach to deal with adaptation. Because adaptation, as uh, my good uh, professor uh, Yuba Sokona would say, is about development first. And you need to integrate climate in national development planning processes. And this is a tough job. And, and, and uh, uh, Zenabu, my, my good sister Zenabu, also addressed one of the first and substantive gap, which is data. Uh, Fatima would remember that as, as the former head of the Africa Capacity, uh, you know, uh, ACPC, the Africa uh, Climate, Climate Policy Center. The lack of data across the value chain, you know, because we need to produce data, translate data into information, translate information into policy. So when 70%, we told WMO tells us 70% of the physical infra, observational physical infra in Africa is either obsolete, outdated. Well, how do you then uh, formulate concrete policy, strategy, project, program, where you're lacking that, that very basis. Mm -hmm. And the financial institutions are telling you that you need to differentiate development and climate change. This is very serious. So this is also where we need you scientists. When we go and access money, as much as from an implementation point of view, we're told that we need to integrate climate in national development planning processes. When we want to access finance, we're told, hey, can you demonstrate what is the development part of this and what is the climate part of this? Because we're just interested in funding the climate incremental cost. We're not going to fool your all development. We're just going to fund the climate part of your development. Extremely difficult. And, and we actually, and, and I'll stop there very quickly. Sorry for that. Yeah. We, we've tried as Africa to, uh, um, to do a matrix of our different gaps, you know, gaps in formulation. So, you know, formulating science, formulating policy, formulating practice, so projects and programs is very tough. Mobilizing resources, having African institutions which have the fiduciary ESG gender standards to mobilize money, blending financial resources, and the local issue is the most difficult for us because climate impacts are local specifics. So the, the policy options and the policy choices have to be also locally driven very tough uh, indeed, but, yeah. but, but the work is helping us in, in advancing okay. uh, our cause. Thank you very much. Um, let me just come back to the question of um, research. Um, and now I really want to ask a question with respect to research and the value of research, the value that we put on research. Uh, Jean spoke about the investment uh, 
that the IDRC has made uh, and research is part of its DNA. But even with that investment by the IDRC or from the UK government, there's still a very low percentage that has been uh, set aside or provided to African institutions. Cool. Oh, of poorly equipped research infrastructure to a cycle of researchers that are enabled, that have the research capacity and that can support adaptation knowledge and be able to understand what the risks are. Um, Adelina. I think you are you're muted. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I was just saying that the ambassador has alluded to the fact that there's so much uh, lack in terms of data. There's so much data that's not available immediately. Uh, I think I want to add the fact that it's not only data, it's actually documentation. So um, we may have difficulties in terms of collating all the data that's being generated because it's usually generated for different places. So again, local uh, context, um, very specific. Um, they, they may have uh, different periods. They're, they're, it's very difficult to put this all together to actually make sense of it. But in documentations, I think that that gives us a starting point, especially as researchers. I'm currently involved in a project that has been a collaborative project with the University of uh, Cape Town and University of Nairobi. And we're trying to investigate the linkages between um, climate projects, so climate action on the ground by a country, and social inequality. And as a first step, what we were supposed to do was actually scope on the kind of projects that have been ongoing and um, which are completed or still ongoing and get documentation on what their um, specific objectives were and how that would influence communities. And surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, I, depending on how you look at it, it was very difficult for us to be able to come up with the documentations for all the projects that we were aware of. Eventually, we were able to contact, pers have personal um, engagements with specific people who would then guide us to uh, the project information. Um, but it was very difficult getting uh, information on the project proposals, for example, if there were any midterm evaluations and, and um, final evaluations as well that we could use to actually start the work that we need to do. But comparatively in South Africa, this was something that was very easily done because all the projects had been uploaded into country, like national, as well as county level portals. So uh, depending on where we are, if we're speaking as West Africans, I think documentation is one of the first steps that we, we, we need to look at. It's not only in terms of sharing of projects, but probably serving as a portal or some kind of a, a platform that researchers can also collaborate with uh, within. And um, we, we were alluding to the fact that there are very poor structures that are available to continue research. But I think where people are able to come together, um, share ideas, and then build on what they're each doing, then one plus one is not equal to two, but it's, it's a much higher number than that. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Zainabu. Uh... Madam Zahou Sagda. You had spoken to us a bit about uh, the aspects that are associated with women and the impacts of climate change, the interrelation between gender and climate change. Uh, shouldn't we go beyond the uh, simple hypothesis uh, to, to go beyond speaking about the fact that women are more vulnerable? Uh, shouldn't we look a little further into this research? Yes, obviously, obviously, because it's true. Their vulnerability begins with their social role. Their social role uh, 
brings them into their environment uh, where they come from and that's where their vulnerability come from so when there are environmental problems they are not just vulnerable and that's the interest here and the role of women that is really key in this uh, mosaic of actions with respect to fighting climate change uh, and women have knowledge and we must be able to use this knowledge but in order to do so we have to be able to involve them uh, and that means uh, that we have to try to understand uh, the specific needs of those women and the needs in their reproductive activities uh, but the activities that they're involved in as well for example let's talk about agriculture they are involved in all of the value chain in this sector and that's significant but with respect to reinforcing uh, capabilities we don't see women there women are on the land but they don't own the land so they don't have any training etc let's talk for example the forestry sector what type of transportation do they use uh, in how do they how are they able to have income uh, but the fact uh, that they don't have ownership of a land uh, as a result it's difficult to, to have data effective data on their participation uh, and it's hard to take them into account in that sense uh, so it's really important to go deeper in order to have a proper understanding oftentimes they're victims of maladjustments uh, because the, they aren't taken into account or they're just uh, they just have too much work to do that's why we are asking that they be taken into account uh, when we talk about resilience uh, generally this is really a significant need for them uh, and the importance as well of involving them uh, in the discussions about uh, community resilience women have a key role to play as a result uh, the means of productions generally could be profitable for them uh, to make it easier for them to have access to land uh, to finance uh, to financing and also so that, that they're able to effectively participate in the fight against climate change uh, and also in the community's efforts on that front but also at uh, the international level so I think that we're coming to the end of our conference I think that we should have uh, a bit of time set aside for questions uh, but there's a question that I would like to ask uh, Edmund and Christopher with respect to financing because this is perhaps uh, obstacles to adaptation so perhaps we could uh, ask uh, both uh, Christopher and uh, Edmund why is this financing issue still an insurmountable uh, problem well for a number of reasons says the ambassador Nafo is that the volume of uh, financing available for adaptation is very low based uh, uh, when compared to the needs uh, for example if when we look at what Africa receives right now with respect to international financing for adaptation we have perhaps four to five billion dollars per year and the needs are probably ten times higher than that uh, and the other reason as well is in order to have access to international financing uh, whether that be financing coming from whatever source uh, whether it's bilateral or multilateral the development banks uh, there's a project cycle that exists uh, and unfortunately the cycle project the project cycles can go from 12 to 18 or 24 months also in order to have access to financing uh, people are asked to have a number of abilities uh, fiduciary dis, uh, abilities uh, also technical uh, capabilities technological environmental so what is your ability to prepare projects 
that that are gender specific and all that uh, makes uh, access to resources very complicated. What I was saying is that the real world in the private sector, when we talk about mobilizing resources, it, it represents a full-time job. Uh, there are bankers who do that job, who do, whose job is only to do that. Uh, but today, when we talk about resource mobilization, mobilization goes well beyond the ability of people and experts who work in on the environmental side of things. Of course, these people are very knowledgeable, they're doctors, uh, but when you ask them, for example, to be involved in financing, uh, to try to involve the private or the public sector, they don't really have the skills to do that. So at the African level, uh, what we need with respect to our local, regional, and national levels, we need to be able to develop these skills, uh, develop these skills with respect to mobilizing resources. It's a full-time job. And of course, uh, African institutions provide good examples. There are countries that have uh, two, three, four uh, offices that are able to invest in institutional capabilities to do that work. That's the reality. Thank you. Bring you in. Um, Seni's talking about this being a full-time job, and we probably need new competencies. Perhaps you could say a word or two about, um, maybe just a word, actually, because we're running out of time <laughs> on finance, on climate finance, and why it's so problematic still. Thanks, Fatima. Um, I think the, the, the report, as the assessment, uh, identified multiple challenges, um, a, a lot of them in the African context for multilateral climate funds. So that's things like the Green Climate Fund, um, but also the Global Environment Facility. There's a lot of funding that goes to readiness and less funding has actually gone to project implementation. And so there needs to be an uh, not so much a shift of funding, but with an increase in funding, there needs to be much more funding for implementation as opposed to just a focus on planning and readiness. And with that, there are also a lot of um, barriers to finance flows, which uh, the requirement would be for a lot of those to be reduced. There are a lot of barriers around um, sort of preliminary studies, qualification of particular projects based on certain certification schemes. And one of the things the reports identifies is reducing a lot of those barriers. And in the research context, that's where research financing can really help. If you've got a rich set of information already in place and a strong local research infrastructure that's receiving direct funding, and this is a key opportunity the report identifies is that research funding, and this is something IDRC did in the context of the IPCC chapter, is the funding came straight to us as African researchers and empowered us to really take a leadership role in the research, as opposed to the funding going indirectly through other research institutions where we were then left just as local partners. And so I think the more that kind of empowerment of local institutions for the information can, the more that can be done, hopefully the more information is readily available for the planning and readiness activities, and hopefully also the more multilateral and bilateral climate funds um, can remove many of those barriers or reduce them and meet the African countries kind of halfway, both because we'll have a stronger pool of local information, so planning is made easier, and also many of the barriers um, can be reduced somewhat. Thanks. Thank you. Let me hand over um, to Jean, because I think this has been very rich, but it's impossible to summarize. Uh, Jean, over to you. Thank you, Fatima. Now we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I, I don't have much to add because the conversation has been rich, dense, and substantive. Uh, this morning, we've had a great uh, picture of a chapter nine of part two of the IPCC's report. Physical science and basis. Part two is about impact adaptation and vulnerability. And part three is about the mitigation to climate change. You can find all the data and the report on the IPCC.ch site. Madame 
Uh, Ladies, gentlemen, participants, uh, I think uh, that we will take one step back uh, as we come to the end of this discussion. Let's think together, and we won't have an opportunity to answer this, uh, but I'd invite you to keep this thought with you. We have been facing a pandemic over the last two years, uh, and we saw the world mobilize itself, uh, mobilize itself with respect to research on a very complex situation and a situation that's not resolved. Uh, we're on the way to resolving it. But what we saw was a very different treatment per region, and that's what we're seeing right now. How can that experience, how can that experience help you to spread the message that uh, through massive investment on research, on complex situations, solutions can be found. Uh, the IPCC report, the six report, uh, and the information that was uh, brought together by the two leaders of the chapter, Edmund and chap uh, Edmund rather and Christopher, their work shows us uh, beyond all doubt uh, that we're very close to midnight. So everything that the researchers can do, everything that citizens can do, how can we move to another level so that we're able to face this uh, emergency rapidly by taking into account our knowledge, but also taking into account on the need for all of us to have a coherent message to act, uh, to act with resources uh, and uh, resources, as you mentioned, that can go directly to the actors, the people who are involved in Africa. You can send your responses directly to me or to the IDRC. I would be very interested in knowing what you think about all of this. Uh, it has been a fantastic presentation. And for the vote of thanks, I'm going to call in my regional director for West Africa and Center Africa, Mrs. Julie Crowley. Qui est notre directrice régionale pour l'Afrique de l'Ouest. She's our regional director for Central and Western Africa. She would like to speak to the audience before we leave you. So I would like to thank again our audience for being with us today and our brilliant, uh, our brilliant speakers and panelists. Julie, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lebelle. In fact, uh, the time has come to thank uh, our presenters and our moderator and our panelists. Uh, so Edmund. To Edmond Totin, uh, as well as Dr. Christopher Tristas, uh, the Climate Risk Lab and the African Climate and Development Initiative and in Africa presentation. Dr. Fatima Danton from the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa. Thank you so much for steering the discussion in such interesting directions. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Dr. Adelina Mensa, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Environment and Sanitation Studies in the College of Basic and Applied Science at the University of Ghana. Monsieur l'Ambassadeur Seni Nafou. The Ambassador uh, Seni Nafou, who is the Naf Ambassador and is a representative of the negotiators, and also Zenebou Zegda, who is an economist and also works uh, with the women's groups. Uh, et experts, ce fut un honneur de vous avoir sur ce panel et à très bientôt, j'espère. Thank you for being with us on this panel. It was an honor to have you and I would like to thank uh, all the colleagues from uh, the IDRC and I would like to mention uh, Georgina Michele, Bruce, Heidi, Lancelot, Fatimata, Yolande, Mélanie, Chris et Christine. Uh, and once again, thank you very much. Uh, I invite you to consult the regional fact sheets that are prepared by the Climate and Development Knowledge Network. They are available now. We will put the link in the chat. Et aussi, si cela vous intéresse. And if you're interested as well, you can share with uh, your colleagues this webinar that will soon be online uh, on 
Facebook, uh, Twitter, and YouTube uh, on that. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today, and we hope that you will be with us in future events. Goodbye.